Welcome to the lecture on Tennyson, one of my favorite poets. Um, if you turn to the page in your book on Tennyson, I'm going to touch on some of the historical background uh, of his life. Um, it opens up by talking about just how popular Tennyson was during his own lifetime. Um, he was immensely popular. He was so popular that he, after he became famous and he was granted a peerage, he built a house and there were these gates that he had to keep himself separate from the populace. I mean, this man was mobbed. People would leave gifts at the gate. Um, so, I mean, I just the, the idea of a writer being that popular, I mean, I guess the only, I guess maybe Stephen King or J.K. Rowling are the, the closest I can think to of uh, someone having that kind of popularity. And it even says that during his life, I mean, it, it was it would have been uncommon to find a home that didn't have a collection of his poems in it. Um, but as so often happens in the era right after his his lifetime, he doesn't fare well. He's often made fun of and mocked as being sentimental or whatever, right? Um, that you know that that's quite common. That in the next generation trying to find their own place in the canon, trying to make their own names, they oftentimes attack the the big ones before. But by and large, Tennyson you know, is considered one of the greatest poets in the English language. Um, and so that was a very short respite from understanding just how great he is. So in terms of uh, his life, he was the fourth son out of 12 children of a man named George Tennyson. Um, George was the son of a wealthy landlord. He was the oldest son. He completely expected to inherit um, his father's uh, property and land. But for some reason, he was disinherited and his younger brother inherited instead. And so George all of a sudden has to find a career. So he becomes a preacher. He joins the clergy. Um, and he spends the rest of his life pretty much a bitter drunk, um, you know, angry that he didn't get the the inheritance that he deserved. This makes family life quite contentious, uh, unstable. Uh, one brother is put in an asylum for the rest of his life, He's an opium addict, uh, fought with their father. Tennyson seems to have weathered that, though he is a very shy person. Um, and his father, though he was a, an abusive drunk, manages to hold it together enough to tutor uh, Tennyson in the classics and Latin uh, and modern languages to prepare him to go to Cambridge. When he does go to Cambridge, oh, before he goes to Cambridge, he is dabbling in poetry. He writes, I'm thinking, let me see, where's your book say? He mimics uh, Milton uh, or Byron or even the Elizabethans. He does put out a small book of poetry. It's not well received. Um, and then he goes on to Cambridge and he becomes friends with a group of undergraduates called the Apostles that are led by Arthur Henry Hallam. Hallam um, becomes Tennyson's bestie right? He even gets uh, engaged to Tennyson's sister, but Hallam dies when he is eight, in 1833, when he's quite young. Um, cont you know, we look back at Hallam as being a, a great loss. He had such potential. Uh, all of the apostles actually were quite exceptional. And they brought Tennyson in. They encouraged him to be a poet. They exposed him to much more bigger ideas than he was ever exposed to. Because again, living at home, he was quite isolated and didn't have a lot of connection to people outside of his own family. So this was a real eye opener for him. And he decided to, to be a writer. Uh, unfortunately, um, he had to leave Cambridge because of finances and family problems. So he goes home and he really starts focusing on practicing poetry. And one of the things that you can see when you look at the different drafts of his poems that we have is just how much he edited and revised and worked on these, right? Um, it just shows what a technician he really, he really was. Right. So again, his early volumes were not well accepted. And Tennyson, unlike Keats, <laughs> did not take well to the criticism. But he did learn from it and he continued to write. Um, and in 1850, when he published, um, in 1842, he published a volume and, and that was much better well received. But in 1850, when he published In Memoriam, A.H.H., uh, -A -A which was written to Arthur Hallam, um, this kind of cemented his, his reputation. Um, 
And uh, that was the same year that Wordsworth stepped down as Poet Laureate and Tennyson became Poet Laureate of England. Um, and, and this is also where he starts making money. He's able to, in 1850, uh, finally marry uh, his wife, Emily, that he'd been in love with since 1836, because, but because he was so poor, he couldn't marry and provide for her. So this was another thing that um, caused him a lot of grief and sorrow in his life. But he does marry her. And from that point on, he lives, like your book says, a very comfortable life. He made as much as 10,000 pounds one year um, from his poetry, uh, which was quite a lot of money. Um, he did purchase a house. He a was able to live in relative seclusion because of the, the estate. Uh, like I said, he was given a peerage. Um, and then um, that was in 1884, and he died in 1892 and was buried in Westminster Abbey in Poet Corner, where the great poets are buried, other, unfortunately, except for Byron, right? Um, as your book says that, um, you know, after In Memoriam, people often say that his poetry did not exceed the, the first volumes, that success, you know, was not good for his poetry. That's, you know one position there are still some fantastic poems the idols of the king right his arthurian section has some fantastic poetry um uh, maud and um i think what is the other one um oh it just went out of my head um loxley hall haha <laughs> loxley hall are quite unique in what he's doing loxley hall is really kind of this poem that deals with technology and the fear that we will somehow start regressing, right? That we will lose all of this. Uh, Milton, I mean, Tennyson is fascinated by technology. He is, though, like I said in the opening lecture, a reflection of all of the doubts and confusions that many Victorians feel, especially after Hallam dies. And he has this really agnostic, I mean, in memoriam, he starts writing that in 1833 after Hallam's death, and he doesn't finish it until like 1848, maybe 1849. So that's, that's like, what, 15, 16 years that he spends writing this poem. And it really is an elegy to Hallam, but it's also a almost like a diary of the progression of grief, right? Um, he often writes around Christmas time um, of every year, like it's another year since Hallam has died. And that makes sense. Christmas is a time when you gather around friends and family, right? Um, it is a time where you're supposed to have hope because you're celebrating the birth of Jesus. And yet it, it is a time that seems to really bring into conflict, you know, his doubts. He also was quite a fervent follower of science. And so this is, you know, we're finding all sorts of ge geological evidence of the earth being much older and evolution. And so this also shakes his faith. But by the end of the poem, he comes to some sense of hope, right? That there is purpose, that he might not understand it. And that's what faith is, but that in everything that happens. I think he, one point he says when even a worm is cut in two or something like that, that there is a purpose for this, that there is life beyond that, right? So he comes to some closure uh, for that, right? It is a long poem. Um, it I had things assigned and somehow it got knocked off your reading list. So, um, uh, you know, I again, something that you can skim if you wish. Um, uh, but it is, it is a very interesting progression of one man's grief and sorrow and attempts to cling to hope and find answers. Um, the idols, um, it's spelled I-D-Y-L-L, -L, we would say idols, but in English we say idols. The idols of the king are his Arthurian uh, attempt to write an epic. The Lady of Shalott is not part of the idols of the king, though it later becomes part of it. He writes this much earlier than the idols, but it is still part of um, that or that longing for the Arthurian. So he's very much like the Victorians that looked to the past, that kind of, you know, now now some of them, like Matthew Arnold, don't believe that there's anything worth writing about in contemporary world. Elizabeth Barrett Browning does not believe that. She writes about stuff that's all about 
now, right? Tennyson seems to be a little bit in both, right? But he tends to go to that more Middle Ages kind of romance, right? That, And yet he's writing these things and yet they still have meaning in today's world. So the Idols is about the downfall of this great civilization, right? Oftentimes, uh, uh, one of the major themes is abandoned women uh, and how women can inspire, but also how they can destroy, right? Um, and so we, we do see him connecting contemporary concerns with these, but he, he loves writing about these older topics, right? Um, one of the things your book talks about that he is well known for is how his description of scenery um, actually it says um, has capacity for linking scenery to states of mind right so I'm going to show you um, a section from the Lotus Eaters they did not have this section in our book or I would have had you read it this is one of my favorite passages and um, so the Lotus Eaters is referring to one of the adventures of Odysseus, right? They an they land on the island of the Lotus Eater. So the Lotus is the opium pop, right? And so they eat it and they kind of get drugged and have this, you know, dreamy like existence. And, you know, they, they, they fall asleep and this is dangerous, right? And so this is, I think, one of the uh, best passages that I think that passages that can reflect this idea that how he used scenery to reflect kind of a state of mind. So um, so here it is. There is sweet music here that softer falls than petals from blown roses on the grass, or night dews on still waters between walls of shadowy granite in a gleaming pass. Music that gentlier on the spirit lies than tired eyelids upon tired eyes. Music that brings sweet sleep down from the blissful skies. Here are cool mosses deep, and through the moss the ivies creep, and in the stream the long-leaved flowers weep, and from the craggy ledge the poppy hangs in sleep. How sweet it were, hearing the downward stream, with half-shut eyes ever to seem falling asleep in a half-dream. Right. Um, so if you think about this land of the opium, right, the poppy hangs, right, that's the opium poppy. This this imagery is all about this languor, right? And everything is just soft and flowing and beautiful and it creeps and it's a slow progress, right? So um, to me, this is a really great uh, example of how he uses description, the sensory, lovely description and it really links to this mind state, right? So we can see that in some of his other things, but that's one of my favorite passages that, again, I also wanted to share that with you because it's not in our book, and it's like, yay, I love this one, right? Um, so uh, as Tennyson is still grieving with, you know, dealing with his grief, um, you know, people are, you know, talk about, some people are criticized that, you know, that this melancholy uh, isolation is one of those common themes that he sees. And we can definitely see this in um, Lady of Shalott. We can definitely see that even in Ulysses, right? Um, and, and again, it's almost like this is, you know, his own state that he's coming through and the things that he's writing about. Um, and, and again, he was criticized by that. And even his friends kind of said, you know, wake up. <laughs> you get, get out of it, right? Um, that, you know, um, John Stuart Mill, who I mentioned before in the opening uh, lecture, uh, said, um, to cultivate and with no half devotion, philosophy as well as poetry. So it was almost this idea that, and I think this is something that's reflected in Lady of Shalott, ironically, this idea of the artist, you know, do you isolate yourself away or do you take part in the world? And somehow by taking part of the world, in the world, you become maybe too corporeal, maybe too of the world to be able to really connect with the muse or whatever. And I think that, you know, Tennyson kind of was disposed to be someone who liked to isolate himself, to just look at the world at a distance. And that kind of creates that melancholy. And, you know, he, he was trying, he tries to break out of that. Right. Um, but again, um, you know, what's going on in the world, the scientific discoveries all kind of just makes it, you know, more, you know, comfortable to kind of retreat and not have to face the 
the, the realities of life that might sometimes break our spirits, might break our romantic kind of views and our idealism. And, um, and I think that's very much what Tennyson is, is talking about in Lady of Shalott. I think it's something that we see in Ulysses. Um, and yet when we see some like crossing the bar, I think he's trying to um, find that hope, right? Um, and again, one of the last thing your book says about him, that even though he was quite fascinated by technology, he really was a man of the country. Your book talks about, again, how he had this very booming kind of voice and people loved to hear him read uh, his poems out loud. His whole physical nature was quite impressive. Uh, we have actual photographs uh, of him. Um, and because of his gravitas, if you will, the way he looked, people actually looked to him and listened to him when he made comments about the world and all of that. And he has had some criticism that he talks a lot, but the philosophy in his poetry is actually quite shallow um, or simplistic, you know, um, I just think that sometimes it's just great to read the poems as poems, art for art's sake. Uh, one of the things I love about Tennyson is that I just love the, the, the language. And so I don't think you have to look any deeper than that to enjoy him. Um, and your take on how philosophical and deep he is, is your own. Um, I, I find him quite deep enough that I don't, I don't need anything more from him, if you will. Um, and so let's look at Lady, the Lady of Shalott. I think I, am partly so fond of Tennyson is that I remember reading Anne of Green Gables as a young girl and there's this place where Anne is uh, recreating the Lady of Shalott and she's on a boat and the boat leaks and Gilbert has to rescue her. If you've not read Anne of Green Gables, go read it. It's a great book. But she's like laying in the boat on, you know, on this little river and she's got her hands crossed and she's reciting this poem and you know, for some reason that captured my imagination and my romantic spirit. And I I, I sought out reading Tennyson after that. And, and that's probably why I love him so much, because it's linked to a real good memory of my childhood, right? So The Lady of Shalott is based on the Arthurian legend of Elaine, uh, sometimes called the Maid of Astolat. And she is a woman who falls in love with Lancelot from afar and dies because of it. Right. So Shalott is an island where she is imprisoned in this tower. Uh, it's kind of like this castle. It's got this tower and there is a curse on her. Right. She's supposed to weave this magic tapestry of life that she sees reflected in this mirror. Right. And weavers oftentimes used mirrors because they're maybe looking at the one side of their tapestry, but they need to be able to see it. Right. And so that that's a common tool. Right. But she's not allowed to look on life straightforward. We don't really know why other than she seems to be given this purpose, right? And if she looks at real life, she will be distracted by it, right? Uh, so we do have four parts and each part has, um, uh, there are uneven number of stanzas, but each stanza always has li nine lines. We don't have a name for nine line stanzas like tetrameter or, or couplet or anything. It's just nine lines, right? Uh, the meter, we have iambic tetrameter. And then we have dactylic tetrameter and dactylic trimeter. So the first six lines are always in iambic tetrameter. And then we have two lines of dactylic tetrameter followed by one line of uh, dactylic trimeter. And that's consistent throughout each of these, right? And it rhymes, well, I said 3131. Three, so you have A, 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 B, C, 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 B right? So you have this alternating rhythm, and though it's not always A, B, C, uh, actually it's always B, you see it flips to D, 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 B, E, 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 B. So four, one, three, one. I'm sure that should be a four, not a three, right? There is a mysterious and supernatural tone. For me, Tennyson is kind of like the inheritor of Keats. Um, and he studied Keats, and he loved Keats. And I think that if you're looking for comparisons um, that Tennyson, perhaps more than any of the other poets of the, that we're reading, is more like the Romantics, um, and, and again, especially like Keats with the the settings in the medieval kind of chivalric time, a mysterious supernatural tone, um, and and I think like Shelley and Keats, this wanting to understand what part the poet plays in life. And how does life 
interact with poetry or with creation, right, in terms of being a poet. He looks at it from a different angle than than Keats and, and Shelley do, um, but I still think he's very much concerned about that, right? Uh, and so one of the themes here is the conflict of light and the art, and the Lady of Shalott is supposed to be the artist who creates in isolation, but once she becomes part of the world, she dies, right? Um, and so this could be about Tennyson struggling with his own sake about poetry, like maybe he wants to write a certain kind of poetry, but he needs to create social change, so what is the duty of the poet? Uh, I think also there's the idea that he was very shy and that he liked to be in isolation, but how can you write about the world if you're not in the world, and yet the world can be painful, right? I mean, He's surrounded by things that challenge his faith and his focus. And so it would be better to, you know, just isolate himself. This is interesting in that the first and last of these parts has the perspective of outside looking in, right? We're looking in on the Lady of Shalott. But the inner two parts, two and three, are really told from her perspective looking out at the world, right? We do have a medieval setting. Right, and so uh, if we see here again, it has a nice regular re le uh, rhythm. On either side, the river lie long fields of barley and of rye that clothe the world and meet the sky. And through the field, the road runs by to many towered Camelot. And up and down the people go, gazing where the lilies blow, round an island there below, the island of Shalott. So you're always going to see that lines five and nine are always going to be about Camelot and Shalott, right? And so in this first uh, part, basically, what it's telling us is that um, here's this tower and this lady is up there and nobody knows that she's there other than a lot of the laborers, the farmers, the reapers, the gatherers who can hear her sing. They don't know what she looks like, but they can hear her singing, right? So we don't know, but we also know that this river floats by the tower and it goes down and it ends in Camelot, right? Um, and so if the next one, right, we see about what her, why she's in the tower, right? And so another possible theme could be innocence versus experience, right? We have to embrace reality rather than hide in illusion, even though it is risky to go out in the world and give up our ideals, right? Or, or see things as they really are. And so again, this could be another possible theme that the lady is innocent in her tower, but when she looks out to the world, um, you know, that experience you know, ruins her and kills her, right? But is it better to live in isolation and only have shadows, right? Or even though your life is short, that you're living it and you're feeling, and so it's worth the risk, right? So we find out that she can't look. She's cursed, right? She has heard a whisper say, a curse is on her if she stay, to look down to Camelot. She, know not, she knows not what the curse may be, and so she weaveth steadily, and little other care hath she, the Lady of Shalott. So she doesn't know what the curse will be. She just knows that she will be cursed. And so she just, you know, weaves, right? She puts into her tapestry. So through her mirror, she sees real life, right? And it says that there's shadows of the world, right? And so if you think of Plato and the allegory of the cave where the people are locked in the cave and all they see are shadows of, like, of life thrown up on the cave and they think it's real, but it's not, right? And that when they leave the cave, when they first come out into the real world and they see the sun for the first time, it's very painful, right? Um, and they want to hide, but they have to keep going, right? I, I don't know how much Tennyson might have been influenced by Plato. He might not have been influenced at all, but it just makes me think of that, right? Read Allegory the Cave from the Republic Book 7 because it's one of those things everyone should read. So she, now the rest of this talks about the things that she can see, right? Sometimes it's women, sometimes it's an abbot, sometimes it's a knight, right? And so it says that she enjoys weaving, right? And using the, the mirror to inspire her art, right? Except when she sees two young lovers lately wed, she says, I am half sick of shadows. Not fully sick, right? She's just not really content, right? 
And so part three, game changer, right? Lancelot, right? And the, this whole thing is just is just detailing Lancelot. So again, it's that sensory experience and details, right? So here, this is where we see maybe that love is dangerous, but it's worth the risk, right? And I give you this thing in stanza 27 of In Memoriam. It's in our book. Tennyson writes the last, I think it's the last little stanza in that whole part. He says, "'Tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all." So, ah, you know where that sentence comes from because I bet you've heard that, right? And I think that this very much, I mean, he probably wrote those lines before he wrote Lady of Shalott. And I think that's one of the questions that we have to ask here. Is her act in leaving the tower and looking at the real world an aspect of this idea that it's better to take the risk and lose that love and maybe die than to always live isolated and alone, right? And so we see this, uh, the only simile in the whole thing is where, uh, is line 12, where he says the Jimmy Bridal glittered free like to some branch of stars, right? Uh, but lots and lots of sensory images, this, this detail, right? Um, but, you know, she can see him in the mirror, but it's not his physical shape, his beauty that makes her mo turn away from the loom and look at the real world. It's his song, right? Now, your book tells you that Tira Lyra refers to, um, I think, a Shakespeare play, and it's a body song, right? So he's singing this really gay song, uh, you know, a little naughty, and that's what, you know, so she sings. Remember, that's the only thing that people know of her is her voice, right? And so it's interesting that it's Lancelot's voice that draws her away. And so it says she left. So notice here that we have a change in the language. We go from um, past tense verbs, he rode and all that, to active present tense. She left the, the, the web. She made three paces. She saw, she saw, right? The mirror cracked from side to side, right? Uh, there's an Agatha Christie story called The Mirror Crack that refers to this, right? Uh, and the curse is on her, right? So I think it's interesting that it's his voice that calls her to it, not his physical beauty, right? And so in the next part for the last one, we see another change here, and that's the weather becomes ominous. It foreshadows the doom. She's losing all. She's lost her art. She's lost the tools, the mirror. It's cracked, and now she's going to lose her life. So she comes out of the tower. She has a boat. Don't ask me where she gets the boat. She finds it, and she writes the Lady of Shalott on the the bow, right? She names the boat. She climbs in it. It says that she's dressed in snowy white. So this is like the robes of purity, right? Like a bride. And she's laying there, drifting down and singing. It's, she's singing a dirge, right? And as she goes down there, the weather changes and um, she freezes to death, right? And there she dies. And so it says, um, heard a carol, mournful, holy, chanted loudly, chanted lowly, till her blood was frozen slowly, and her eyes were dark and holy, turned to tower to towered Camelot. For ere she reached upon the tide, the first house by the waterside, singing in her song, she died, the Lady of Shalott. Right? Singing in her song, she died. I don't know. I love that line for some reason, right? Uh, and so then... Everybody, she's floating down the river and people come out to see her, right? And they, they can see the name of the boat and then they ask and they'll sense it, who is this and what is she? And and all of the cheer, so they're having a party, right? And all of that dies and some of them are crossing themselves because they're, they're afraid. But Lancelot is the only one, right? And it's kind of ironic because he has the last words here right? His voice is what calls her from the tower and dooms her. And he says, she has a lovely face. God in her mercy lend her grace, the lady of Shalott. And so some people want to look at this as very ironic that he knows her only by her looks, right? Not her art or her song, right? And so she gave up everything because of his song. And yet all he can comment on is what she looks like, right? She's a mystery, right? Um, so again, this idea that perhaps when people see poets, they might judge them by the way they look, but they don't know them unless they know their art, unless they know their song, right? They remain a mystery to them. Maybe that's, you know, part of what the message is here, right? Uh, and you can see I've pointed out some... Um, points of figurative language, right? So we have alliteration, the shallop flitteth silken sailed, right? We have um, 
Oh, let me see. I already pointed out the simile. We have some assonance and consonants in the one line, the willowy hills and fields among, right? So uh, the assonance is the i and willowy hills and fields. And the consonance is the repetition of that L, the willowy hills and fields, right? Uh, and so again, like Keats, there's this beautiful sensory detail. Unlike Keats, though, we don't have all of the layers of all of the allusions to different uh, things layered in, like Ruth among the alien corn and, and all of that, right? Uh, he tends to keep his focus on what he's talking about without layering in a lot of multiple illusions. Um, but again, um, not a whole lot of figurative language, very simple. It's really about using the language to, to give us those details, right? So let's look at Ulysses, one of my favorite poems of all time. Uh, Ulysses is the Roman name for Odysseus. Right. This is a dramatic monologue. I have some people seen some people catalog it as a soliloquy, but a dramatic monologue is a soliloquy, right? But um, it's it's a bit different. A soliloquy is usually um, what happens on stage when a character is speaking out loud, but it's really to give us what his internal thoughts are. Right. So it's like if you ever watched a soap opera and you'll have all the times where they're thinking and they're not talking, but we hear their voiceover. That's you know, the way a soliloquy is done on stage. They have to speak it. Whereas a dramatic monologue is really this idea that the the person speaking is actually talking in real time and he's interacting with the environment and he's maybe even talking to other people. And one of the other things that's really characteristic of a dramatic monologue, and we'll see this especially in Browning, who loves dramatic monologues, is that the character's word reveals character, right? That um, as the character is talking, we really understand things about this character that might be in contradiction to what they're actually saying, right? They unintentionally sometimes read, uh, reveal character. Uh, he wrote this in 1833, or he started writing this. So this is written after Hallam dies. So there is this idea, this, you know, of death and making use of life that we feel is inspired by uh, Hallam's death. It's written in blank verse, which is unrhymed lines of iambic pentameter. Right. Uh, and it is inspired by the Homeric and Dante, uh, by the Odyssey and the Inferno, Homer and Dante's version. So in Homer, there is a prophecy that Odysseus will take a journey to sea, sometimes after killing Penelope Suter. So he arrives back from the, the, the war in Troy, right? It takes him 10 years to get back because he's pissed off Poseidon. All of his all of the sailors that went with him are die by the time he gets back. And when he comes back, everybody thinks he's dead uh, because he's been gone 20 years, right? It took him 10 years to fight the war, another 10 years for him to get back. And Penelope has been trying to hold off all of these men who want her to marry them so they can become king. So he has to defeat them and he kills them all because they're all bad dudes, right? So, um, that's Homer's version, but in Dante's version, you know, in the Inferno, when they go to hell, and, and Odysseus would be in hell because he's, or Ulysses, because he's pagan, and so he wouldn't manage to get to heaven. Um, they find out that he has died in this quest, in this sea version, to know all, right? So, and again, I tell you here that, again, he... Um, wrote this not long after Hallam dies, and it kind of expresses this importance of life moving forward after loss. Even though he struggles with moving forward, it's like he knows he needs to do that. One of the themes is to go beyond everyday life and limitations. Um, some of the things that he re that uh, the Ulysses reveals in this poem is really that he's not suitable to be king, right? And that he has this really massive ego, that he has to be the center of the universe, and he just feels like where Ithaca is not it. He also wants to roam, right? He has a wandering heart, ever roaming, um, and it's hard for him to just stay put, right? Other themes can be uh, growing older and facing death, that there's dignity and purpose in old age, the idea of n adventure and knowledge in the place of human lives, temperance versus impulse. Uh, he is very impulsive, whereas his son Telemachus is very temperate, you know, measured, uh, and this idea of hope right? Um, that again, the, the end is quite hopeful, right? Um, okay, so let's look at it. 
So it opens up where he's basically complaining. He says, It little profits that an idle king by this still hearth among these barren crags matched with an aged wife. I meet and dole unequal laws into a savage race that hoard and sleep and feed and know not me. So look at all of the barren, lifeless images. The, the, the hearth is still. It's not you know, full of life and heat. The crags do not grow anything. His wife is old, so she is barren, right? And he describes the people that he's dealing with as like animals, right? They, they just exist on a most primitive level to survive, but they don't think, right? And they don't know who he is. They have no you know, idea, right? And then he says, I cannot rest from travel. I will drink life to the lees, right? Just the very last drop. All times I have enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly, both with those that loved me and alone, on shore and when through scudding drifts the rainy Hyades vexed the dim sea. I am become a name. Wow, what a moment, right? So he's saying that, you know, he's had all this life, right? He has suffered by himself and he's made it through. He's he suffered with love line, loved ones. He's on the sea, on the shore. And he says, but now he says, all I am is a name. I'm not, I'm living on my reputation. I'm not increasing it, right? And he says, for always roaming with a hungry heart. So there's kind of an implied metaphor here that, that he's almost like an animal, a predator, right? He says, so now we see his egoism coming through here, right? That, you know, his unsuitability to be king because he's like, he thinks that governing these people is boring, right? But now we see his egoism. And he says, much have I seen and known, cities of men and manners, climates, councils, governments, myself not least, but honored of them all, and drunk delight of battle with my peers far on the ringing plains of windy Troy. I am a part of all that I have met. Yet all experience is an arch wherethrough gleams that untraveled world whose margin fades forever and forever when I move. Ah, oh, right. So he's saying, right, so here's my bona fides, right? I've, I've, you know, drunk at the table with the best of them, and I am not least among all of the greatest that I've known. And I have fought these battles, right? And he says, and I am a part of all that I have met, right? Right. But he says, there's always more out there. And it seems that the closer I get to that unknown existence, the farther away it, it gets, right? And so this is that, the idea that he's, he's never satisfied. He always wants, and again, Odysseus, if you read the, um, the Iliad and the Odyssey, he is given the, uh, the moniker of clever Odysseus. He's the one they go to. He's the one who thought up the Trojan horse where they all, you know, hide inside and the Trojans bring it in. And that's how they finally defeat the walls of Troy. But it is very cleverness that undermines him because he starts to think that he's smarter than the gods, right? And this is why Poseidon, uh, and, and he kills Poseidon's son, the, the Polyphemus, who's the Cyclops, right? Um, and so he just, he, he lacks humility. And I think we can see this here, right? And so he says, uh, how dull it is to pause, to make an end, to rust unburnished, not to shine in you. So we have this metaphor then of um, life is like being a sword, right? That, you, you know, you have to use it or it, it you know, to not, to not shine, right? Uh, he also has the metaphor up there that experience is an arch, right? That it takes us, right? Uh, he says, as though to breathe were life, right? So this is the difference between living and existing, right? And his people are fine with just existing, but he wants to live. And he says, life piled on life were all too little. And of one to me, little remains. So if you had life upon life, if you could live multiple times, that would still not be enough. And he says, and I don't have much of my life left. I'm old, right? He says, but every hour is saved from that eternal silence. Something more, a bringer of new things. And vile it were for some three sons to store and hoard myself. And this gray spirit yearning in desire to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bound of human thought. So he's saying like, you know, that every time, every moment that you have, you can still discover more. And he says, and it's been almost a sin for him these last three years to just sit here and not pursue it, right? But think about to pursue knowledge like a sinking star. A sinking star is a falling star, right? Um, and you can't ever catch it, right? 
And so now he comes to this kind of damning with frank praise. He says, this is my son, mine own Telemachus, to whom I leave the scepter and the isle. So he's made his decision. He's leaving. He's abdicating, right? He says, well, love to me, discerning to fulfill this labor by slow prudence to make mild a rugged people and through soft degrees subdue them to the useful and the good. Most blameless is he, centered in the sphere of common duties, decent not to fail in offices of tenderness and pay meet adoration to my household gods when I am gone. He works his work, I mine. So he's admitting here, he is not suitable to be king and all of the things that it demands. It's too boring. It's too tedious a job, right? So he will fulfill what he's supposed to do. And I can, we, we're just too different, right? And so then the last stanza here, where he is now active, right? There lies the port. The vessel puffs her sail. So we have personification, right? Uh, there gloom the dark, broad seas. My mariners, souls that have toiled and wrought and thought with me, that ever with the frolic welcome took the thunder and the sunshine and opposed free hearts, free foreheads. You and I are old. Now, here's what my questions were. At the end of the Odyssey, all of the mariners that have sailed with him are dead. So I'm not sure... If he's seeing the spirits of them, if the journey that he's taking is death, if this is metaphorical, right? Because they're all dead. So I'm not sure about that, right? And then we have synecdoche, right? Synecdoche is when a part represents the whole. So he's talking about them as souls, right? They're the souls that have toiled, right? You know, they are like him, that no matter if it's raining or if it's sunshiny, we're going to meet every challenge. And then he says, you know, old age hath yet his honor and his toil. So there are things that we can still do. He says, death closes all, but something ere the end, some work of noble note may yet be done, not unbecoming men that strove with gods. The lights begin to twinkle from the rocks. The long day wanes, the slow moon climbs, the deep moans round with many voices. Come, my friends, tis not too late to seek a newer world. Push off, and sitting well in order, smite the sounding furrows, for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western worlds until I die. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down. It may be that we shall touch the happy isles and see the great Achilles whom we knew. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Oh my gosh, right? To think that he wrote this fairly young. This sounds like a poem for an old man to write, right? Um, but it isn't. I mean, it's really this understanding of life is about seizing the day, right? And that no matter what your stage of life is, there's always something to do, right? And he says, no matter what the fate is, we're going to seek a newer world. We don't know what world that is, right? And again, if he's talking about the adventure of death, that, you know, you see the happy isles when you die, right? So maybe that's the newer world, right? But this last line about to strive to seek, to find, and not to yield, that actually is a line that's kind of taken up by a lot of the Victorian poets as a banner of hope for the new world, that no matter what it gives us, we cannot give up, right? No matter the doubts that we have about our faith or about the way society seems to be failing, that if we give up, we know we're not going to succeed. But if we're always trying, if we never give in, that there is hope that we can accomplish something, right? So very much a, a very, a, you know, a poem about the times, right? Um, in the Eagle, I just, this isn't something that has a lot of in-depth, but I just think it's a really great example of a very short, but uh, a poem that has that beautiful art artistry, right? So personification, right? The eagle, he doesn't have hands, right? He clasps the crag with crooked hands. Close to the sun in lowly lands, ringed with the azure world, he stands. The wrinkled sea beneath him crawls. He watches from his mountain walls. And like a thunderbolt, he falls. I mean, talk about a lovely way of describing the way an eagle waits. And of course, what is he doing? Well, he's going to get a fish that's in the that's in the, the water, right? And he's like a thunderbolt. It's like, phew, right to get it, right? So there's a beautiful simile. I just love this poem. I think it's, again, a delightful little way of showing how, you know, Tennyson could really use that language to create this, this experience, right? And then the last one, I always include Crossing the Bar. 
and we're studying Tennyson. This was the last poem he wrote, and he kind of made it uh, a requirement that when anybody published a collection of his poem, this always had to be published as the last poem, right? And so this is just a really long metaphor for death, right? So sunset and evening star and one clear call for me. And may there be no moaning of the bar when I put out to sea. But such a tide as moving seems asleep too full for sound and foam when that which drew from out the boundless deep turns again home. Twilight and evening bell, and after that the dark, and may there be no sadness or farewell when I embark. For though from out are born of time and place, the flood may bear me far. I hope to see my pilot face to face when I have crossed the bar. Now you'll notice there's not a lot of regular rhythm here. There is some, but there's there are a lot of sussures. Like we say, sunset and evening star, and one clear call for me. And may there be no moaning of the bar when I put out to see. You have to kind of give that pause to get that rhythm right and I think you have to consider every two line every couplet one full line to kind of get the feeling but such a tide is moving seems asleep to full for sound and foam when that which drew from out the boundless deep turns again home so again it's very irregular it does have a regular rhythm a b a b right um but it really is a powerful metaphor of the, you know your boat, right? Again, we think about the classical idea of uh, Chiron, you know, taking the souls across the river Styx. This is a very common metaphor for death, this idea of a, of a sea journey, right? And he says, you know, I just hope that I can see God, my pilot. So there's a, a, a metaphor for God as the pilot, right? Um, and a pilot, if you think about ships, uh, a pilot is someone, remember the rhyme of the ancient mariner, when the pilot and the hermit and the pirate's mate come out to get to beat the sea. The pilot is kind of like the ar harbor master that comes in to get the ship and often is the one who steers the ship into the berth. Because a lot of these ships might ne don't, not know the... Um, the the bottom of the ocean well and so the pilot is one who knows how to steer the ship based on its size to make a safe passage and so here it is God is like uh one who's going to take that boat and once Tennyson has crossed the bar right he is going to to guide him home safely right okay so there's Tennyson for you um again read more and more Tennyson he's wonderful um the idols of the king are quite delightful um not exactly what maybe you expect from Arthurian legend because a lot of what we see when we see movies about Arthur are very romanticized uh, and this is really kind of about the downfall of Camelot. Um, if you take Brit Lit 1, which we're offering in the fall, face-to-face uh, -face class, uh, we will read Mallory's More to Arthur, which is about the death of Arthur. Uh, and again, people are really always shocked when they read actual literary versions of Arthur because, you know, when we see Merlin or something like that, we, we have a more modern-day, romantic, uh, uh, noble version of some of these things, right? Um, but again, there's a lot of really wonderful poems. There's also um, selections from the princess uh, that he has in there. Um, the princess itself is a collection of poems, and it kind of reveals maybe a misogynistic theme with uh, Tennyson that, you know, women are not deep thinkers. Uh, but there are some wonderful things like Break, Break, Break and Splendor Falls and Now Sleeps the Crimson Petal. Uh, again, if you liked uh, that section of the Lotus Eaters that I read or the Eagle, then I think the princess has a lot more of that kind of poetry. So uh, I shall see you in our next lecture, which will be... Um,